the spaceship by Ian Robinson. Dave shouted from the end of the curved platform, It's coming! He could see further than me. He climbed up one of the old semaphore signals. I was at the apex of the curve, ready to see both ways if necessary, covering all the bases. It was a dull, snow flurried day in December 1967, and we were both cold, but not wanting to go home until we'd seen a steamer. There were still some about back then. We copped a few the previous weekend, although it felt wrong somehow. At least in my adolescent mind. Stalking the demented old things as they wandered querulously about. They thrashed them to perform a few last duties before being dispatched to the knacker's yard. Gradually the smoky, snow-laden wind, swirling up from the mills below, carried the sound and the smell of something else. A cocktail of creosote, tar and sweet hot steam oil. The music of machinery and singing rails became louder. I thought often that the sound was something Hendrix might conjure up with his effects pedals and genius, but this was better than any guitar music, better than anything on Radio Caroline. It was rhythmic, syncopated, yet with a faltering energy that made you uneasy, a slow ribbon of oral expectation carrying towards us on the rails. Chong, boil, chong, boil. Dave climbed down and ran along the platform towards me. He mumbled as he struggled, icy fingers fumbling with his ancient hand-me-down camera. Bloody hell, if this is another Ater, please, please make it a Black Five or a Jube, anything but an Ater. I smiled, only there for the hell of it, unable to run to the luxury of a camera or a fancy portable tape recorder like Dave's dad. In the last year, Dave and I had quartered the North West from Crewe through Bolton and up to Lostock Hall, drinking in the last golden afterglow of a dying era. That was some pub crawl. But it was no swan song, although the historians might paint it so later. Rather, it was a gasping, tortured crawl towards oblivion, a slow snuffing of the guttering candle. It was painful, and yet we wanted to see as much of it as our adolescent means would allow. Today, we were standing on the deserted platforms of Mosley Station. We were waiting for something, anything but an eater, to come out of the industrial gloom. I'd have been happy with an eater, though. A Stania eater freight loco, common as muck at one time in these parts, but scarce now. I could see a column of black smoke above the scrubby birches at the end of the station. The gradient here was a steady one in seventy. Nothing to trouble a car or a cyclist but something to take into serious consideration when you were pulling 400 tonnes of coal or a heavily loaded passenger train on greasy metal rails. Dave said, Look at the smoke! She's in trouble! Short of steam, you reckon? I nodded and sniffed. The tang of steam coal was strong in the air now. The sound was becoming louder too, a racking, sharp bark, followed by the strange, liquid yet metallic boil. An icy blast of wind caught us suddenly. For a weird moment, Mosley became the Russian steppes, the flurried snow driving at us like a thousand tiny Cossack blades. The wind flanged the sound like the drums on that small faces track, Ichiku Park. For an instant, everything seemed dusted with white. Visibility was now no better than our neighbours' twitching neck curtains, as the snow drove into us, covering everything in sight. My duffel bag containing our sandwiches and Tizer looked like a miniature snowman at the edge of the platform. I was aware now of the dark bulk of the locomotive, perhaps a hundred yards away, heading for us, black as a hot devil's house in the snow. Rust and lime scales streaked the vast boiler, and a red glow came from the cab. In the gloomy snow light, my imagination made it an angry, vengeful thing. It must have been the weather, but... For some strange reason, I knew that Dave and I were going to be made to pay. Took all my resolve to stand rooted to the spot. I glanced at Dave and I could see that something similarly mad had gripped him too. But I wouldn't let myself down by running suddenly for the exit. That was when it happened. There was a massive roar, a horrible clanking and a column of black smoke soared up out of the whiteness above us. A shower of boiling, filthy water and red-hot coals followed almost immediately. These dispelled the snow, soaking us, then singeing coats and making eyes sting. 
The cacophony ended as suddenly as it had begun, and everything became silent, except for a bubbling low whistle from close quarters which made us both jump. Dave shouted, Bloody hell! A cry which was answered from the black bulk looming out of the snow with further expletives. It was then that the curtain of snow lifted, and we saw her properly. Motionless now, a few yards away, streaked with white stains mingling with the rust and soot on the impossibly long boiler. I am the god of hellfire and I bring you a bloody spaceship, Dave roared and started taking photos. I don't know why they had that nickname. Someone officially classed them 9F, but spaceship seemed to suit them. Perhaps it was something to do with the Sputnik space launch at about the time they were built. Perhaps they looked so futuristic compared to the old locomotives that had gone before. You either loved or hated them, but we thought they were pretty swift, and I was always pleased to see one, even covered in grime and clag like this. I'd never seen one close up, though. I'd heard them often enough in the night freights. They punctuated the dark marches of my nights with that laboured bark. The neighbourhood dogs sometimes answered uneasily. I summoned my courage and walked towards the loco. Even from the comparative height of the platform, she was an awe-inspiring sight. The huge slab-like smoke deflectors at either side of the smoke box towered over me. The chimney belched yellowy-brown smoke. It sat menacingly above the boiler, which was itself hunched slightly towards the cab, as if about to spring. The machine radiated heat, snowflakes instantly steaming on contact. I was aware of a vaguely menacing grumble coming from the boiler, as if it was engaged on some secret inner dialogue. There was hissing and ticking, snow and coal and the sweet smell of steam oil in the air. For a fanciful moment, I was face to face with a creature from the night. They'd dragged it up from some secret court of hell, despite its obvious mechanical distress. I felt such exhilaration in its presence. Dave disturbed my reverie. He'd been daring enough to speak to the crew. She did a bloody great slip. Nearly bent her conrods, the driver said. The fireman had let the boiler get too full, and when she slipped, she primed like a kettle. That was all the white stuff. He reckons as how they'll have to set back and charge the bank. I muttered my surprise at this, and followed Dave back to the cab. We watched like acolytes as the two titans of the footplate attended to the mysterious workings of the machine. Everything done, of course, with studied nonchalance. The fireman, a youngish man with what looked like a grubby handkerchief tied at all four corners on his head, leaned out over the cab doors and smiled. All right. I nodded, feigning a manly indifference. He continued, Ah, well, our bloody will be when we get rid of this old demic. A voice from within the cab grumbled in disagreement, then let a loud, long-suffering oath out, sharply reminding the fireman of a recent misdemeanour. All right, mate, all right. The man winked to us and retired into the red glow of the cab. Dave turned to me and, in rather indignant tones, muttered, Demick, this one's only seven years old. Look at the state of it, covered in rust and crap. It felt wrong, somehow profligate, to treat something so valuable like this. Last year we'd been chasing locos around the system that were nearly sixty years old and still going strong. There wasn't the money to clean the locomotives properly or the will to take care of them any more, it seemed. This was the end of an era. I almost wished I'd seen the glorious age of steam in the twenties and thirties, even if it meant having to die in battle somewhere. Dave and I, we were born too late. But we could appreciate what was here in front of us, and we were going to, even if it snowed for a week. Besides, there were butties and pop in the duffel bag. We would have a siege. There was more shouting from the cab as a man shambled up to the loco holding a lamp. I reckon he's the guard, Dave whispered. He'll be wondering what game on, I expect. There was a discussion with the driver, and then a decision reached. The guard shambling off the footplate and back down the line to the end of the train. The driver moved some wheels in the cab, which started a roaring in the chimney as a cloud of white steam rose to the sky. Blow us on, Dave announced. Must be pulling the vacuum off. It was only at this point that I noticed the train, which comprised of over twenty giant oil tankers. Ironic, really, I thought. A steam engine to pull all this oil. A small wiry man in a railway uniform interrupted our thoughts. He asked us if we were travelling anywhere by train today. If not, why not? And we would need a platform ticket, didn't we know? 
We went to the machine on the platform and duly bought one each, while the porter berated us about train spotters. Our own Mr. Perks, isn't he? I confided to Dave, and he chuckled loudly. I said that I thought the local's whistle must have woken him up from some deep slumber. We were laughing at this when the local whistle sounded again. Three long whistles this time. Oh, he's setting back. That's dodgy. He probably can't start her uphill from here on this curve. Dave nodded sagely. I often thought that I knew as much as Dave about railway matters, but in our very companionable way, he was usually the spokesperson. My job was to come out with the occasional humorous gem, sometimes the more demanding role, when morale had to be kept up on a long train-spotting stakeout. Without warning, the platform was lost for a moment in a cloud of steam from the cylinder drain valves. The huge locomotive backed her train up slowly downhill. We watched, fascinated, as she retreated in a series of groans from the wheels and woofs from the chimney. She disappeared round the curve. When all fell silent again. It seemed like an age before the loco gave one short blast on the whistle, and an immense column of smoke plunged upwards as if from a volcano. The harsh barks from the engine's exhaust echoed back from the valley sides as she charged the hill. The driver, hanging out of the side window, would have his regulator full open, watching for the first signs of any slip. I noticed a woman walking along on the snowy pavement below the station. She carried a bag full of shopping, completely indifferent to the elemental struggle going on above her. A black cloud now hung over the hillside as the driver made the welkin ring, accelerating towards us. As she came round the curve, I felt again a thrill of fear and excitement in my stomach. The train seemed to head straight for us, all smoke, steam, hot metal, momentum and brutal noise. Then she was level with us, and the ground was shaking as the mighty piston rods wrung the wheels round. Somehow you felt the power of it within your body. Our internal organs were being battered by the forces of nature and physics in one last throw of the old magic. Dave and I turned as the loco passed, and we had a glimpse of the red-hot world on the footplate. The driver transfixed at the regulator, his fireman throwing coal into the firebox as if his salvation depended upon it. Then she was gone, woofing up the gradient, the oil wagons drumming a reluctant tattoo on the rail joints. At last, the guard's van appeared, stovepipe chimney smoking. Unexpectedly, the guard was on the veranda watching the progress through the station, and gave us a surprised wave as he passed. We stood there for a good five minutes, listening to the sound of that loco going off into the distance. Then we looked at each other and laughed. I'd forgotten the cold, or that I was hungry. One of the new diesels was burbling somewhere up the line. We're both aware of it, and that it signified the new order that was destroying our world, the world of steam. An unspoken sadness pervaded us. We were coming down from the sight of the spaceship, and it felt that nothing would be the same any more. I went to get the duffel bag, but stopped, hearing something else. Dave heard it too, and stood comically with his head on one side, like a blackbird, listening for worms. I was about to say something, but Dave stopped me harshly. Shut up! Listen! The diesel's burble had slowed to an idol now, but something else sounded over the frothing of the interloper. A metallic tink-tonk, tink-tonk, and a roar the sound of a big loco coasting. Something was coming downhill towards us, and at a rate of knots. Dave stood at the edge of the platform, camera in hand, mouth open as if to catch the sound and eat it. Dave, I said, venturing a point of railway knowledge. It hasn't come under High Lane Bridge yet. That froth box must have been put in the loop. Dave responded with a stern yet approving, Aye! At that very moment there was a roar, and a sound like an explosion as the train plunged out from under the bridge half a mile away. I turned to Dave, shouting now in excitement. What the hell is it, do you reckon? A B-1? A Black Five? A Semi? Dave smiled. Don't be daft. An Eater, probably. We both ran to the down end of the platform to get the best view of whatever was coming. I slipped crazily in the snow, making a comical balletic leap, but I stayed on course. We both laughed madly at each other. Hell, this was fun while it lasted. And better not dwell on the other stuff. Scrap lines of locos at sheds. I called friends lying dead and discarded. It was almost too much for our teenage minds. 
This was it, the here and now. Come on, shouted Dave. Come on! As if in response, a big loco appeared at the end of the platform. It approached at speed, the tink of the valves mixing with the sound of tortured wheels squealing round the curve. The chimney was roaring, spouting a white frenzy of exhaust. She let out a deep hooting whistle. Bloody hell! Another spaceship! Dave screamed over the tumult. A blast of air almost knocked us over, and the loco was upon us. A hundred and forty tons of locomotive, doing over sixty miles an hour. I goggled in amazement, seeing the crew, the driver, a man in his forties, and the fireman, probably not long out of his teens. He was leaning out of the cab, grinning, and giving us the V sign. We both roared with laughter and excitement as the train passed. A long line of maroon coaches, full of enthusiasts to judge from the people hanging out of the windows with cameras. The sound of the train faded, and we stood there laughing and speculating about the crew and the wild speed of the loco. Dave looked at me. Hey, those jokers were completely off their heads. I hope they get a hold of the train by the time they reach Staley Bridge. I felt sure that, if I was a driver assigned to an enthusiast special, I would have done just the same, taken it to the limit of the line speed in one last exploit. Dave seemed to read my thoughts as he kicked some snow off the platform. How long before she goes to the scrap man, eh? I gave an exasperated sigh and said, Forget that, Dave. Come on. Let's eat the butties. We both gazed up the platform to where we'd left the duffel bag, but it had gone. What the hell? Dave shouted. The bag lay on the side of the down tracks, cut neatly in two. The bottle smashed and leaking orange tizer. Caught up in the wind, caused by the spaceship as she passed. A final offering to the god of steam.